Awesome. I've it looks it looks like we are live. Probably we are live. Yeah. Sorry for the initial uh totally unreasonable context switch that we made. Yeah, uh, but you know it happens sometimes when a threat uh gets to another core and you need to bring all the context with it. So uh sorry folks for uh the, the unusual link replacement. Yes, sorry, sorry for that. But we are eventually we are so eventually consistent uh, YouTube channel. Awesome, awesome. So welcome everyone here today. We want to present you some kind of webinar about threading, which is also kind of a demo of our one of the lessons that we are providing as a as an expert course. But this is like just a fun for share some knowledge about threading. So if you don't care about course, OK. But if you care, you will be just also know something that there is such a course. But it will be about threading. So we are starting. And uh, that, that's all. I don't know if you would like to add something. Yeah, I mean, basically, my name is uh, Szymon Kulec. I use Skulec as my nickname or handle in all my online activities that I want you to know about it so uh, that are public uh, and I'm one of .netos. Uh, yeah, so today probably I will be providing some interruptions for uh, Conrad navigating through, through the slides. But yeah, let, let's move on. Great. Hey, my name is Conrad Kokos. I'm one of .netos and uh, also like topics which are just about dotnet ecosystem internals performance and threading also and async and other stuff so after the short change of the slides let's move on to the presentation i believe the topic today we will cover our threads so in general threading as i said uh, so the very first question that we can start from is what is the threat in general? And I maybe we can try to find some very formal definitions, like for example that there is a it is a single unit of execution on the operating system level or something like that. But I don't like formal definitions because we start we can start to argue about what uh, some caveats and small details about such definitions. So maybe just start from more practical uh, side. Uh, imagine that you have a method and it is a obviously C sharp method because we are .NET developers. Of of course, it could be a sharp method, right? Our Visual Basic method. But in in the end, uh, we have this method it has a nice code language as you probably all know and in the end when we start such a program we maybe not we but the JIT compiler it converts it to a native code so in the end we have this byte uh, a byte region memory of bytes that is representing the uh, opcodes that should be e executed by the CPU. Obviously, we can see uh, those uh, as a nice assembler, but this is not uh, how the CPU is seeing things. This is just description of those bytes that are just saying what should be executed. And this is what is happening underneath, right? Uh, we have a method that in the end, it is just a native code to execute. And now if we say about uh, executing native code, probably we can ask also on what machine it will be executed in one con it, what context. And we can imagine a few contexts and we will cover them here. Like the most common scenario probably is just a single CPU. So we have a single CPU on a, with a single socket in a motherboard of our desktop or laptop and it will be executing this code. Also, if you are rich enough or you have uh, server machines or s something like that, you have maybe you have a multiple CPU systems, so there will be multiple CPUs. And those are interesting, but most typically, currently, we will also call, use something which is called hyperthreading or SMT in case of AMD, which is very nice, interesting technology that we also cover. Uh, how, they, how they all relate to executing a code, which is just C sharp code, for example. Yeah, speaking of uh, the multi CPU things, 
um, I think that the, the, there is this called called Numa architecture, right? So w where you have different or a few uh, CPUs that uh, have um, uh, a segments of memory aligned with them or assigned to them, uh, you can call it groups. And uh, I think that this also falls into this multi-CPU system category, right? Yeah, yeah. This is a, another level of abstraction, right? We can start from building groups from single CPUs and group them logically because of better data locality or so. But OK, this is another very nice topic for another webinar, probably. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> OK, so imagine. So let's let's just follow the simplest possible scenario. So we have a single CPU and we have some code to execute. So starting from the hardware part, we have CPU, which is so nicely dri driven by me here. And we have the CPU, which just is now to execute uh, the code. And to execute this code, we have a concept uh, which is called hardware thread. And this is represented by a physical core. Obviously, CPU has some much more things inside, like, for example, an integrated graphic card, controllers, uh, caches, and other stuff. But the heart of it is a hardware thread, also known as physical core, which is able of decoding the stuff that we are providing in terms like the, the here is a body of a method and let's execute it because it is able to decode instruction by instruction and by decoding making all the things that those instructions should do in fact we execute this program that is to be executed so we have this hardware thread concept on one hand and on the other hand we have something which is sometimes called software thread because it is more general concept uh, living on the operating system level uh, so uh, operating system level uh, so this is a description what should be executed. Uh, so here we, here we have some context regarding uh, th that. So for example, CPU registers, the state of this thread, the mode of this thread, whether it is in kernel mode or user mode, and other stuff that can represent software thread. We can imagine an operating system not having software threads for very low level stuff. Yeah, like microcontrollers or other, but obviously the systems that we are using have software threads, yep. right? Uh, yeah, and so now we have those both sides, like we have hardware thread, uh, which is real physical something inside CPU that is able to execute and software threads, uh, general concept. Yeah. Then, Obviously, we have to map somehow one to another. So we will be talking about mapping uh, software threads to hardware threads, which means simply executing, which means the context that we have now is also somehow living inside the CPU because we are using registers and we have to have some address spaces there and so on and so on. So here uh, we are just have this possibility to put single software thread inside a single hardware thread. This is a very uncommon situation. I'm even seeing uh, such a question here in, on the on chat. It is a very uncommon scenario that you have a single CPU with a single core, which is probably unlikely to buy today. But this is only for the uh, sample scenario to describe. Yeah, today probably it's more like, like a kind of an artifact that you can put in an ivory box and just uh, watch in, 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 uh, because it's, it's so unusual to, uh, to meet one. I wanted to stick to the one information that, that was visible on the previous slide as well. I mean, in the thread context, there is this, uh, beside uh, CPU register state and mode, as you described it, there is this called thing, uh, there is this thing called uh, TLS. So that uh, stands for uh, thread local storage, right? So if you if you ever uh, saw thread static or yes, use yes, uh, use thread local storage, uh, yeah, uh, or or use the uh, slots and or the uh, things related to the thread thread local storage, uh, then that's the thing in the in the thread context that needs to be moved uh, with the whole context when we are thinking about putting it in the core. 
You're muted, Conrad. Mick, something happened to your mic, or is it only me? Right now, so another technical issues. We are full of technical issues. Sorry, something has happened to my microphone now. So I just switched to but to, to worse quality. But at least I'm probably you hear me now. Okay, so you said about the thread local storage. That's that's interesting side note. But we should be aware that thread local storage by itself is very small because in thread local storage is a set of machine-wide slots, in fact. It is not like data itself stored there, but it's just a kind of map. And those slots are used typically to prove, to, to, to use uh, to store a pointer to a data that is mm -hmm. visible for per thread. Not the data itself are there, but the pointers to the data. But still, it is some bytes. And we should be fully aware that it has, it is happening tremendously often, like, we will cover that soon. Okay, so I have I hope that's enough for of technical issues for today. <laughs> let's let's continue. So uh, okay, so we have this situation, but as we said, this is a single CPU at slash single core scenario, which is very very uh, uncommon. Then we have this uh, server kind of scenario with multiple CPUs. So we have a motherboard, which is supporting single multiple CPUs, very uncommon for desktop even. And then we have obviously multiple hardware threads because now we are truly uh, are able to execute in parallel multiple software threads because every CPU obviously has at least one hardware thread, so they are running in parallel. They almost share nothing, like obviously they share memory, they share some motherboard and other stuff, but in general the CPUs are quite independent here, so we are talking about true, true parallelism here. That's, that's nice, but very expensive, like I would say. So that's because of that, and the most common scenario now, and the economic one scenario is just to share as much as possible and have multiple cores uh, slash hardware threads inside a single CPU, because now they can share the graphic card, caches, uh, our controllers, other stuff, but we have multiple hardware threads, multiple physical cores, and now they are running multiple software threads. Obviously, here parallelism not, is not ideal because they share some caches also. So they are not super independent, but at least all, almost independent. So we can say about parallelism here also. So we have multiple software threads being executed by multiple cores on a single CPU. Yeah, uh, again, probably the, uh, uh, a well-written program uh, that that understood uh, that that has this understanding of the underlying hardware at least uh, at some point should be a bit better. For instance, you can imagine that if the, these two hardware threads would be writing to very same piece of memory, trying to access it, you can imagine that 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 this is would be like a terrible for ter performance because there is a, a single resource that is accessed from um, multiple sites or uh, cores yeah. or hardware threads, as, as, as Conrad mentioned. But again, that brings this kind of, uh, um, how to say it, um, approach that, as Conrad mentioned, you can use one socket, share memory, one GPU, but still enjoy and have multiple cores and multiple hardware threads inside one single uh, CPU. Right, that's much more economical approach. Uh, also, there are some interesting caveats, for example, false sharing, but we will not cover this because 
it will be just too much for for a one hour because we yeah yeah we, we would need to say that extend it for for a few we hours expect to have this webinar for around one hour so don't don't be afraid we will not Right. I have no internet problems, but I'm I'm just getting used to technical issues. So <laughs> let's move on. Okay. So now we have this interesting uh, technology that we mentioned. Here. We we were talking about uh, hardware threads and in general hardware, but let's move on for a moment for on uh, on the software side. So uh, typically, when we have a method. Uh, this method is consisting of two types of instructions. Some of the instructions are strictly CPU bound, like they are doing some calculations. For example, if you multiply two numbers, you have those numbers in registers and you need to execute this multiplication. Uh, all the other are arithmetic calculations, a lot of other instructions that are truly CPU bound because they really need CPU to execute something. And on the other hand, we will have a, a lot of IO bound instructions because they are accessing memory. So every time we access the memory, we will have such IO bound operation, which is just a waiting because obviously in terms of CPU speed, speed accessing even caches is just a very slow operation. So um, every IO bound operation is slow from the perspective of CPU. So we have these programs, which in fact are interleaved by two groups of instructions, CPU bound and IO bound. And typically they are really interleaved because we are just getting something from memory, doing something with data and storing. So it is just through interleaved stream of those two groups. So in the end, we will see programs as the stream of such instructions and they will have such called so-called micro stays or micro weights, micro pauses. Micro, micro pauses introduced by those IO bound instructions when we access to memory writing or reading from memory. So this is uh, what the typical stream of execution seems to work. And looking from a hardware thread perspective, we will see that we will waste uh, resources because if we will just doing that in a, from a, using a single core, it means that it will be just waiting half of the time because typically, let's say statistically, that it will be half of the time waiting for the memory access. So this doesn't make sense because we have only, for example, two cores. So wasting it for memory access is just wasting very, very limited resources. And based on that finding, the very interesting hyper-threading uh, technology has been introduced, which is just as simple as interleaving those two streams of uh, instructions. So when one stream is just waiting on something, we can now execute this CPU bound instruction of another in, uh, thread. So we are interleaving two threads, and thanks to that, uh, there is, are no weights now, because typically we are just consuming this thread, uh, this hardware thread now optimally, uh, on the basis of typical uh, stream or typical instructions of our programs. Yeah, uh, I so, mean, you, you can easily see in here that, for instance, uh, you've got this dark blue and uh, like the not so dark um, uh, or light blue, however that would be called. Uh, you, you can see that on the boundary where there is this access to the memory that Conrad mentioned, uh, uh, the, to prevent this micro tail, another part of the code of the, of the other hyper thread is, is run. And then we, we have this uh, chunk of time that the uh, where the access of the memory mem to the memory can be actually um, made. So once it's done, we can go back to the first thread, and again the second hyper thread uh, has ability to to wait uh, a little while to um, be able to write or read from the memory. So again, it's like the going back and forth, back and forth. Uh, every time the the, the, the hyper-thread waits, there is a potential for uh, running the other one and then uh, waiting a little bit to, to to do not have this micro-stale in, on, exactly. in your core. 
and just uh, run this other part of code when the access of the uh, to the memory is being performed exactly exactly and this is like utilizing this physical core optimally now but now we will talk about also logical cores because we have a single physical core and only and two logical cores so we are doubling them and obviously when you buy cpus currently for you will see in specification that you have four physical cores and eight logical cores that's because exactly because of that and this is also why we for example tripling or i don't know how to say making four hardware quadrupling <laughs> quadrupling uh, doesn't make sense because the interleaving of the it is does not it doesn't make sense we have not we don't have so big uh, where threads inside a single core would make sense but two it's okay and that's that's very very nice now obviously it is not those threads are not truly parallel like we have like more concurrency simulating parallelism by executing in sequence uh, this interleaved stream of two uh, threads but that's okay for sure now they share um, even more because they're share caches of the even the highest level but still it is really beneficial and obviously nowadays operating system are fully aware of that so they are try to schedule threads accessing similar data to have the uh, on them on the same physical core because it's just it's good for them because they will share the data from the caches so yeah. so this is a quite sophisticated machine trying to to be optimized so that's that's we have double number of logical cores versus physical ones okay so i have this covers in some details the hardware part. So now we have this situation that we have many threads and this single CPU with say, let's say eight logical cores or two or one, it really depends. And obviously we have this situation very common that we have thousands and ten, ten of thousands and hundred thousands software threads to execute because every application adds hundreds of threads so we really don't care about that unfortunately probably so we have this huge bag of threads to execute and on this graph this very poor single hardware thread <laughs> that is just trying to execute them all which is obviously quite difficult uh, thing to do so when we want to start some uh, threads we are just putting it inside the cpu as we said the context is created this is also important because creating a thread is a cost like we need to create the whole context for it on the operating system level also in case of dotnet dotnet also tracks some data per thread so there is additional cost in case of dotnet when we create a thread and then we just run it and after some time obviously we need to switch to another thread because there are thousands and then we can only execute one at once so uh, we are just doing something which is called thread switch so the previous one was just stored to the memory because we need to store somehow at which point we interrupted the previous thread and what is was the state of it so we need to save all the context of it to the memory which is obviously big cost and then we need to create, for example, another context and put it in the CPU. And if the both threads were running uh, previously, we have those contexts. So in the end, we need to switch contexts. So we need to take one context to the memory, select another thread to run, and load this context from the memory. In, and so again, another memory access to restore the context of the previously, exe previously executed uh, uh, thread. So this context switch, because this is called context switch, is a real cost. Like we really would like to have no context switches, but unfortunately it is not possible. But having them as, as few as possible is very good because this is a cost. Having a lot of context switches means we are just some have some kind of contention on the CPU level. We have so many threads that CPU is all context switching them a lot, and this is overhead. And in the end, the CPU will be mostly concerned about context switching and not executing the, the real code. So observing context switch counter, for example, is a very nice way of seeing what is the utilization of your CPU. 
Yeah, again, even if this uh, specific operation, I mean, the context switch can be quite heavy, you can think of it, or sorry, you, you can, uh, by, by lowering the number of threads that you actually use and by decreasing the number of context switches, you can think of it like amortizing of, uh, uh, of this cost uh, in time. So uh, every single thread will have a, a, a bit longer period of time uh, on, on the core and then the context switch will happen. So the, the less threads, uh, the less overhead, or in other words, the overhead is amortized in a better way. Right, another, another internet issue on my side, but luckily you were, so, you were, you were talking, <laughs> so oh, great. So uh, also, if you have any questions, you can think about those questions, even, even write those questions now, and uh, we will just try to answer in the real time or maybe at the end. But if you have any questions, do not hesitate to ask on chat. We really like questions because this is kind of feedback from you also that you are not sleeping, so <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we have this context switching covered. This is, yeah, this is pain in the ass. Oh, sorry, this was not a... <laughs> uh, so we should tr try to avoid it. It is said almost, but obviously this is not a, any kind of agreement that it costs a few thousand CPU cycles to make a context switch. So we we'll waste uh, a lot of uh, CPU cycles just because of context switch. Uh, this context stores kind of information that we already covered, like, for example, the most important one conceptually is the uh, instruction pointer. So we need to understand at which instruction the, uh, the switch has happened so we can resume from the next instruction and so and so on. The mode stacks uh, information about the priority and st state that we will cover uh, soon. So that's the context. That's why it waits so much. I believe we covered it already. So uh, how to decide which thread to run? Because we now have hundreds, thousands of threads and this few single hard, few hardware threads that can execute them. Obviously, we could do some kind of round robin, like let's execute them in uh, sequentially and start over or randomly like this, 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 <laughs> this, they are quite good scheduling mechanism probably, but for sure we can make something more sophisticated. So obviously operating system has their own scheduling uh, algorithms. I believe a lot of master thesis and also other scientific papers was written about this topic. So this is a huge topic. But in general, the concept is easy, <laughs> let's say. We have thread scheduler that is responsible for scheduling. In one, For example, in case of Windows, there is no single thread scheduler class or any method. It is more spread around the whole kernel. That is just the common logic of scheduling but it depends on this operating system level or on the system level generally linux has its own but conceptually they are very similar like first of all all threads are treated system-wide so there is no uh, per process for example grouping we have multiple processes in, in our system but in the end a thread scheduler is treating all of them as a huge bag of threads it doesn't care about what the threat is from your application. It's just seeing the threats to schedule. Then scheduling is preemptive. So it is kind of aggressively possibility to aggressively kick in and kick off any threat at any moment. So it is not cooperative, like threat is not saying now I could be switched off. It could, but it is not like that. In general, by default, it is preemptive. So the possibility, the thread scheduling is quite powerful. And then we have this quantum based approach, uh, which means that typically we would like to assign software thread to a hardware thread to a some called quantum time at maximum. And if it is passed, we should just want to, we would want to kick it off because it is just consumed too much time. So it will be assigning uh, hardware threads for some quantum times. 
Obviously, it might be preempted also, even during the quantum, we will cover that in a few next slides. And also, there is a concept of priorities. So not all threats are treated equally. There are priority priorities, so some threats are have higher priorities, some have lower, which means in the end, the goal of threat scheduler is to give this uh, result that the priorities with higher, uh, sorry, the threads with higher priorities are executed often than the threads with lower priorities. So this is for just kind of level of the aggressiveness, how often the threat will be scheduled. Yeah, right. and, and there is this uh, notion of that, that there is at least one runnable thread that always runs. And probably yeah. you could name it like the idle process or whatever, right? Yes, because it would be strange to have no <laughs> thread running <laughs> on the hardware thread. Yeah, and this is this, yeah, and those concepts obviously are. We, we books were written about that, but I believe this few attributes quite nicely describe the overall idea of scheduling both in Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. So. 99.9999% of our systems that we use. So in case of uh, the qu regarding quantum, interesting side note, you can configure it in Windows. Obviously in Linux, you can just recompile your kernel and set whatever you want. <laughs> but in case of Windows, we have, we have a combo box. <laughs> so we have uh, two options. Uh, we, uh, if you look at the performance options in from the control panel, there is an advanced tab and there is a, this uh, mystic processor scheduling uh, option. And you can choose from two possibilities. Uh, we can schedule for best performance, as it is called, for programs or background services. And this doesn't mean anything if you don't understand what it means and in general this means that it really influences the threat scheduling in case uh, in terms of quantum so if it's set to programs and programs is a disc the default setting for every windows desktop version like windows 10 windows 8 9 and so on so on so it is a short quantum because uh, we want to have ma want to maximize responsiveness. So if the user clicks something, we really want to respond fast. We want the context switching happen happening often because we have many operate ha many applications interactive in our system. So we want to respond in a fast way. So we will have a short uh, quantums. Moreover, they will also be variable because, for example, if uh, if we are considering the foreground process, which for example now you have probably Chrome opened. It is a foreground uh, foreground process, so it will have these quantums even shorter because this is the one that the, the user is interacting with. So we want to have this responsiveness for it even bigger. So we will have kind of switches. Uh, what is this quantum? This quantum is here two clocks, so very fast. Like if a software thread will be assigned to a hardware thread, it may be at maximum two clocks. So it is like very short. And then we have the background services option, which is for default for Windows Server, which is about throughput. So it is not about responsiveness. Then we will have a long fixed quantums, uh, six times longer quantums, just because uh, we really want to minimize context switching. And we assume that if something starts to be processed by the hardware thread, some caches has been filled, let's uh, allow this thread to process as many as possible. If it this thread assigned, let's do its job, Not do not interrupt it. So it is not about interactivity, but about um, throughput and minimizing context switching and reusing caches, in fact. So this is nice and probably uh, quite surprising that you can control it, that changes immediate. You can change it even now during the webinar and uh, Probably you will not notice the difference, but if you measure any application that is, for example, processing something, probably you would see some difference. You can measure it with benchmark.net, for example. Yeah. Yeah, so this is uh, uh, the quantum uh, thing. And you obviously you can use a registry to change it even more granularly, but 
but this is this is thing that it is interesting and regarding threat priority in case of windows this is only a number in fact from 0 to 31 0 is reserved for this very special threat inside the windows operating system so we cannot assign 0 as a priority for a threat but then we have this uh, range from 1 to 31 and uh, what the priority of a threat can be and this is controlled on based on two settings we have uh, settings of we can say the priority class for the whole process so we can say it is normal above normal or for example idle so this is the set those are the settings for the whole process and uh, then we have a setting for the every particular thread inside the process so that it will also fine-tuned and this works like that if we said uh let's say let's start from normal so every process is by default created uh, with this normal priority class which means this is the range of the thread priorities that uh, they can have inside this process so those indicated by those boxes so by default we can choose from those five and additionally from those two uh, let's say boundary edge cases of priorities and so now we have this class of priorities uh, inside this process and with the help of those settings we can control which of those priorities will be set if the threat is normal inside a normal priority uh, application it will be eight like here if we reset uh, the priority of a threat to highest it will be the highest here it will be just fine-tuned by plus plus two uh, priority so it will be 10 or we can set it to the lowest it will be six or we can set it to idle and it will always be one not depending on the priority class because the idle is always one or the uh, time critical is always 15. So thanks to that, we can control the priorities of the whole process, which will influence the priorities of every thread inside, such, inside, uh, inside the process, and then fine tune the threads here on the base of the priority class for this uh, thread, right? Any any side notes interesting here? No, I, I mean I, I just wanted to to add that this picture uh, is not an encouragement for setting the priority as high as possible and right. trying to make everything else look uh, look like an idle process or something. <laughs> That's just for uh, like the learning purposes. Uh, if you want to play with it, play carefully. <laughs> Yes, yeah, exactly. As we will see also in a few slides, uh, the ag aggressiveness of threat scheduler is very big. So the higher priorities are really, really uh, killing another lower priority threats. So if you set it for a high priority, you can starve another threats for a moment. And as you see also, there is a very interesting group which stands out here. This is a group called the real time. So if you set, if you set the priority class for for a process as a real time, the whole the the every thread inside will have this priority bumped by 15. So we will just move to these very high values. Uh, the normal thread inside a real time application will have a priority 24. It is very, very big, big number. So the other applications will have real problem to get the processor, uh, yeah, to get the access to the processor. As you see in Task Manager, you can set it. So if you choose some application like Chrome and set it here, set priority, there is a real time. So if you are brave enough, <laughs> you can try to set it for some really working application doing something and maybe your system won't be blocked by it, uh, this application because the system threads also are thread scheduled so and if you set a time critical thread priority inside a real-time application it is just the highest possible priority so it will be killing the whole system quite significantly so be really careful about doing that although for sure this application will run very fast not the system, but this application. 
<laughs> we'll run very fast. Yeah, if you really want to test it, do it after the webinar. That that uh, that will ensure that you will be able to wash it till the end and not just observe <laughs> your CPU melting for uh, right. an, an example uh, process already. Yeah, I imagine some tight loop that is doing a very simple check and then setting this thread priority to the time critical inside in time application. This is really <laughs> nice experiment. <laughs> All righty. OK, so that's uh, thread priorities in case of Windows. And uh, in case of how it is exposed to .NET, very simple, in simple way. We have priority class uh, uh, property of the process, so we can set it uh, to one of those classes. And we have priority property of a particular thread, so we can also control it inside our application. So you can consider bumping it a, a little more if you have some very important calculation to do and to speed it up you can bump up priority for example to the highest which means it will be prioritized thread inside your application probably also comparing to many other threads in your whole system and then if you have very idle job which is you don't care so much because it is just processing something in background also you can think about setting it for example to idle so it will be very slow but it will not influence anything so that's how you can use it in in dotnet but uh this is not all the through that all the true that we just described because if it was working like that we could starve a lot of applications and would be very dangerous if someone set too high priority for something so there is a very important also te technique uh, used by uh, thread schedulers which is called priority boosting because from some time to time it is just it, just make sense to boost some priorities of the lower priority threads just to make some processing done so there will be kind of the priority boosting is just exactly uh, as that it is increasing imagine the most typical um, solution, the most typical scenario that we have some low priority thread, it is ready to work, but it is waiting for the CPU for a long time. So it is unfortunate enough, it has no possibility to execute anything. So uh, thread scheduler will notice that and will bump the priority of this thread for uh, some time. So it will have bigger chance to get the CPU and to do at least something, not to wait all the time. And then, for example, on the other side, if we have a thread that is uh, owning a log, so it is an exclusive, mutual exclusive of some code, it means that it should have this log as lo short as possible because it doesn't make sense to stop other threads waiting on this log. So if thread has a log, the thread scheduler will also bump uh, priority for a moment to have the processing inside the log faster and to release the log faster. Also, for example, if there is I.O. completion, it means that some data from the I.O. device has come. So it doesn't make sense to now to wait for processing. If we have it, let's process them so the pro thread processing I.O.s will be boosted for some time and other things like IO input. So we have a huge amount of situation that will make a priority boosting. So it really allows to make things that first of all are not starved. We have no scenario that something will be really starved because at some point the thread scheduler will notice that. And in fact, it will all it makes all the scheduling working because imagine now we have 10 of thousands threads running on your desktop now and it really works like nothing is stalled nothing is stopped there are no waits this is all just a very dynamic complex machine that is using this boosting and all the scheduling thing to make things working flawlessly which is awesome i believe and I was really, I would be really scared of writing it. <laughs> Unfortunately, it is already written. So, right. yeah, I mean, again, as as you describe it, when it works on the uh, priority level uh, to actually prevent uh, the, uh, the the starvation, but it, it has this one toggle, right? So it, it just bumps up or uh, 
lowers the, the priority and with the one toggle i can imagine that it's possibly a bit simpler that when you work with a single value and then have just uh everything running on top of it right yeah anyway i would rather not to write my own as well yeah i was i i, I was even not pushed to do that during my, the the high school fortunately <laughs> so Right. Uh, so threat state, because we said that we have priorities and we have covered that. On the other hand, threat has some states. Uh, again, we conceptually, there are some three important states. Obviously, every operating system has its own. We can dig in here, but I would like to cover only three most important. So we have the ready state, which means, OK, I'm ready to be executed. So I have all data in place. I can be executed. I'm waiting on the CPU. Uh, so I'm just waiting for the hardware thread. Then we have running. So the running is the obvious one. It is currently executed by the CPU. So it is using hardware thread. So we will have like 4, 8, 20, depends on your CPU, running uh, threads. And then waiting state means that we postponed our execution because our, we are waiting on something from some kind of log, monitor, anything. So which means even accessing memory, it depends, but we are waiting on something. So it doesn't make sense to use me because I just wait for some external data, external event. And the state graph is really simple here. Uh, when the thread is ready, uh, it can be assigned to a hardware thread. So we have the, this thread running. After some time, we will start to wait something. So it will be postponed. It will be moved to the waiting stand. W waiting state after this, after some time, with, when this event on which we are waiting will be signaled, uh, it will be again changed to ready. And thread scheduler will now, after some time, probably assign it again. So it will be running. So it is a typical uh, cycle of the hardware, of the software thread. Obviously, if the if for some time the thread is running, it can and the quantum has ended, it can also be preempted to the ready state because we don't want to assign this thread anymore, or it could be preempted by other events. We will cover that in a moment. So this is a very simple state graph of how state thread states are looking. And now, obviously, when the, we have a thread scheduler, it will be interested only in the threads in ready state, right? Because the waiting are just waiting, so it doesn't make sense to schedule them uh, to the hardware thread. We are just considering and switching those which are in the ready state, ready to be executed. And in the end, it really depends how many logical cores we have. It will be typical, typical you know, four, eight uh, software threads that will be in the running state because now they can be just run by those logical cores. So that's all the machinery now, now trying to put the thousands of threads inside all eight for uh, hardware threads, doing all the context switches, which is awesome that it's working. And uh, regarding priorities, we have this situation that let's describe it in maybe in a few slides simply to show you also how aggressive thread scheduler is. So imagine that you have now we have four threads to schedule. Uh, only one is waiting. Three of them is ready to be run. So they are in the ready state. It means by this color, it means that they are ready. The red one is just waiting. And they have some priorities. Thread number one is, has the highest priority. Thread number two has the lowest priority. So that's how it is. And now the thread scheduler kicks in. Here is the time axis. So we see also the, uh, uh, so it is uh, the, we do, uh, here I will show you the, how the things are changing in time. So we are starting from the situation. Obviously, now the thread scheduler will start from thread number one. It will look around and we will see, OK, what is the current, the highest uh, thread in a ready state? Uh, 
thread number one. So it will be scheduled to the processor and it, the time will pass. So now the time started to pass, it is being executed, the thread number one is being executed by the processor and everyone is happy and quantum time has passed. Uh, so now, what, what do we do now? The thing is that the highest priority thread is still thread number one because uh, it is still with the highest priority, unfortunately for others. So it means even the quantum has passed. In fact, there are no other priorities with the priority higher or equal to the priority of thread number one, which means CPU still assigns uh, itself to thread number one for another thread, quantum because this is how life is unfair in case of priorities in, in the thread scheduling. So thread number one was running, started to run another quantum, but it happens that it was started to wait on something because probably let's say it started to wait on some log or monitor. So now the thread number one is the waiting state so it doesn't make sense to end to the end of the quantum because we will waste the resources now it should be preempted uh, to the pool and now cpu will look for another even not the whole quantum has passed now the cpu will look for another thread with the highest priority which is in a ready state which is obviously now thread number four so it will start to execute thread number four and we'll try to run it for the whole quantum. It, it would happen if nothing has changed, it would happen. But it will not happen because in my scenario, after some time, even before the whole quantum has passed, uh, the thread number one stopped waiting, unfortunately. It is the highest priority and uh, even uh, the thread number four is being executed now. The thread scheduler will notice that the thing on which the thread number one was waiting is now not, is signaled. So the thread number one is again in ready state. So we will be very aggressive now and we will kick off the thread number four and kick in thread, thread number one again to the, to the processor. So as you see, thread having highest high priority will be really aggressive in taking CPU. Even if some low level thread will be assigned for some time, it will may have no, not luck uh, to execute the whole quantum because the even other threads with higher priorities, they can um, aggressively take the CPU. That's why uh, this priority bo boosting is important because, in fact, the low priority threads sometimes could have no access to the CPU at all. So, and this is how the things are happening all the time, thousands of times per second. Like we are just switching all the time. Thread scheduler is trying to assign every thread for a quantum of time, but they can be preempted by some events, and all this machinery is working uh, quite nice, in fact. Yeah, so and if you uh, imagine poking yeah. all the uh, all the uh, thread switches, as uh, as you can see on the, the the other slide as well, this every single bar, if that's another thread, I mean the the um, vertical bar, that might be a context switch if that's the different thread. So that that's just to show you how how dense uh, this picture can be and how many context switches uh, can happen uh, on your CPU. Exactly, exactly. And this is multiplied by number of cores. So it happens per single logical core. So it is really sophisticated machine. Like in the end, we have all the threads executed by the particular cores. Typically, they should work by a, on a quantum basis, but they can be preempted. So sometimes this will be assigned for shorter time. There is this quite nice view in the concurrency visualizer that allows you to see how threads were assigned to cores. It is very nice to see. Uh, we, I believe we covered that in this week, like uh, how to see yeah, yeah. how the threads were assigned to, to cores. Yeah, so this is this is important. Now, I believe this is all nice to understand how sophisticated things are going on, even now when we are talking. And even now when I'm now switching to Visual Studio because I want to show you some demo, uh, 
a lot of context switching is being uh, done in in the background probably so that, that just uh, a really really uh, complex thing could and you increase the the, the font size yeah? a little bit could you increase the font size a little bit uh, right i'm yes sure 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 that's that would be good point okay so and uh, this how is uh, flawless, uh, flawlessly switched make a context switch to a demo which is just covering the usage of the priorities because there is this uh, we have a thread priority uh, documentation on, on Microsoft page, which is just describing that we have this priority, uh, which is nice. It is a property. You can set it. And here is this uh, example of C Sharp snippet that is covering that. So uh, the snippet that is just a simple console application that uh, is using uh, thread priorities to show you that uh, the thread with a given priority, a higher priority will have count of executions higher than the threads with a slower, smaller, sorry, priorities. And this example is nice because I like it because it contains a bug. <laughs> so not, not because I like it because a bug, because what I like it because we, I believe, we fixed it very simply. We created a pull request to the documentation uh, to fix that. And just a few words about why this demo is not so not, not working so so good as one could expect. So let's just explain it in a few words. This this is just the code from the snippet from the documentation, copy paste to Visual Studio. We have the idea is very simple here. We are starting free free uh, threads and setting priorities for them. Uh, one of them is a normal, so by default normal. Uh, the second has a below normal priority, and the third has above normal priority. We are starting those three threads, and then we are waiting ten seconds, and that's all. In me I mean, um, they have some job to do for 10 seconds. And what this job is doing, uh, every of these threads is executing this method, which is simple, uh, increasing a thread static data. We covered that. Thread static is an attribute saying that although it is a static uh, field, every thread will see its own copy, its own, its own version of it. So it is a per thread static, we can say. That's the thread static name is good, good name. And every thread will increase this uh, field by one endlessly. I mean, until this loop switch flag is set. So it is a very tight loop, which is just increasing this number until this loop switch is true and this uh, switch is uh, and this switch is uh, chart between threads because we somehow need to see want to signal that the processing should be ended so we have this uh, loop switch which is just a boolean it is a static it is not thread static so it is shared between threads and uh, at the very beginning it is true until this switch is true it will be executed and as we see at the end of console application we are set 10 seconds, we will switch to it to false, which means that every of this thread will notice that this loop is false. So it will just be ended and we will just print the number, the thread count, in fact, how many uh, incrementation we have done since the beginning, right? Uh, yeah, Anything to add and while I'm compiling? Ah, uh, yeah, just, just one thing probably. You can probably imagine all the different primitives that you could use in here to uh, to just uh, navigate through the start and to start all the threads at the same time, etc. I mean, we, we, we'll covering all this stuff in our async export course, but for the sake of the of, of this demo, which is based on the documentation, that was only about the thread priorities. 
not about starting thread synchronization, etc. So that, that the whole demo uh, in Microsoft Docs was based and focused on the priorities, nothing else. There are so many more uh, methods and ways uh, and so many more uh, synchronization primitives that you can use to make it a better example. But again, to make it short, dense, and uh, focus on the priority, a simple bool uh, field was used. Right, exactly, exactly. So let's run it. I, I built that. Uh, I will just run it. Control F5. I will just uh, uh, choose here because I'm using John Skid demo util. If you don't know it, it is a very nice util that allows you to have multiple main entry points, but doesn't matter. So I'm just using the bad uh, demo, which is the one. And we will see here that after 10 seconds, there will be a result, luckily. Mm, and it, there is, okay, it is. And we see here that uh, during the 10 seconds, the thread uh, with the normal priority, I will change the font probably, uh, also increase the font tremendously. Well, okay, that's good. And uh, Fred with the normal priority uh, was executed so many times. I would like uh, the incrementation has happened all this number of times. The below normal priority was indeed smaller, so it, it was able to increase this number, a uh, noticeable smaller number of time. And above normal was able to increase it again. Uh, valid and due to expectation, it was able to execute this incrementation in a bigger number of times. So it is kind of expected. Indeed, this incrementation behaved uh, due to the priority that was set, right? So the interesting thing is that I was doing this in a debug mode. Let's change it to the release mode now. Let's recompile it and let's run it again. I'm choosing the thread number one, execute. And now we can wait for the results. And uh, nothing has happened. Why? I mean, that's interesting. It was doing something, and I was hearing the CPU that was busy. <laughs> uh, but in fact, there are no console write lines, so we don't know what are the results. Uh, we, the, the console write lines weren't printed here. So in fact, this was not executed. Why? It would be a good question for you to, to ask, but probably, uh, but that's probably not possible for you to follow now, uh, but maybe you will describe yeah. it, Ramon. Uh, yeah, so the, 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 the simple fix, again, by not going through the all the synchronization primitives, because it would take us like four more hours probably to describe all of them. Uh, as you can see, uh, the static bool uh, field, loop switch, um, it, it is static bool, but it's accessed from multiple threads after it's set. So that the, if you could go back up to the, uh, the, the the original flow, we can see that loop switch is um, at at the beginning it, it's false, and then we we are setting it to true, but we are setting it from different thread that we observe it. And if there are two threads that read and write from the same uh, piece of memory, again, I don't want to go into memory models, memory barriers right now, because it would take so much more to describe everything. But uh, as I mentioned, we have two threads. One of them is writing to a specific piece of memory. In this case, that's the loop switch field, static field. Another is trying to read it. There is nothing that prevents the, the, the reader uh, from assuming that this value uh, didn't change at all. I mean, I read it once. 
there was this value. I can cache it. I can uh, even cache it locally. I can uh, proper. I can jit the method in a way that it won't be read again. There are so many ways that it, that you can imagine that this value won't be read again. To to make it work, and to, that that's the PR that that Conrad sent for the documentation. Uh, we can add volatile to this field, and in the simplest words that that you can under so that you can understand the volatile in here that would be that volatile write i mean the one thread is writing to this um static bool field whenever the the reader accesses it this value it will eventually read it as uh as true or as false i mean depending which value we are setting but the, the fact is that the reader will eventually, so it might take one cycle, two or more, but eventually the value will be read as it was written. So with this, we ensure that the threads that we start will be able to eventually read the properly set value and act accordingly. Uh, you are muted, Conrad. Yes, I was muted. Sorry. Right. So now let's compile it and run. I added this volatile. Uh, I'm running this demo again. And after 10 seconds, I hope it will work because in the other case, my PR doesn't make sense. OK, so now we hear, uh, we see the results like it was printed because the flag was observed by every thread. It was not cached, saying that in the simplest word, it was not cached inside a thread, let's say like that. Uh, maybe, so uh, as we see also here, this program is not always executing exactly as we expect because those differences in the release mode are statistically corrupted. I would say it doesn't. I mean, the influence of the whole system in such a demo, in case of the release mode, makes the results a little convoluted, I believe. But at least they are making the results. So we should execute it a few times to see that statistically, indeed, the, the, thread, the priorities are uh considered or oh, maybe that uh, i would also like to show you sharp Lab.io, which is also covered the in the this week in the lesson number one which shows you also quite nicely the difference we will not cover it super detailed here because we are just slowly running out of time but you can use sharp Lab io uh, which allows you to put a c sharp code and then you are able to see the jit result of the method so we, here we have a version with volatile and version without volatile and the difference in threat method will be visible here so this is a case when we have no volatile in the code and here is the case when we have the volatile so by just switching between we see the difference what is the difference on the level of the jitted code and if you like assembler like we do we, you will see that in case of volatile there is the to compare inside the loop there is always a look to the memory and in case of non-volatile version it is just checking cached value into a register that's why the thread is not able to see this change because it's using its own cached value inside the register inside its context we yeah can, uh, Copy paste it to a chat maybe for you to see the difference. Yeah. So again, again, the number of steps that that are made by the uh, by, by jitter and assumptions that are um, that are made because of the processor uh, architecture that we are running on top of. Uh, there are many interacting pieces in here. Uh, yeah. So. That's, just just yeah. going back to the to adding or not volatile, the the simplest description is that 
if you write with volatile the reader and you read with volatile the reader will eventually see this value there is one more thing uh, related with the uh, happened before semantics but again that's a a, a bit bigger yeah, yeah. scope well, than... that's another webinar uh, i mean another yeah. week <laughs> yes so that that's just a kind of grasp about volatile which should be added there and we added pull request for just making this example working mm -hmm. although we could start to think about improving it a little better to make this dependency of the context of the whole machine less fragile but for now i just put a volatile in the pr and we will see again that's okay. not a recommendation to sprinkle volatiles all yeah. over your yeah. code just joking of course <laughs> uh, but again to make it uh, uh the, the simplest possible fix uh, we made it this way so like in case of memory management there is a gold uh, rule that to, you should add gc collect everywhere so now you have also <laughs> volatile to put everywhere and everything will work <laughs> no no and, you won't get my signature under this statement, Conrad. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so just summarizing because we are just running out of time, I believe. Uh, the very important finding for you, although we cover some threat API in the kind in our course, maybe the you won't use threading API directly so often in your application, but knowing all this stuff and understand what is the danger of thread contention, what is the danger of having a lot of context switches, what is CPU bound code, what is IO bound code, it is really beneficial for you to understand. And also all this is also like a basis for understanding more fundamental concepts, like for example, after this lesson, I'm covering in details thread pool, and thread pools also are based on all this knowledge, like avoiding context switches, preferring and uh, handling IO bound operations in a good manner, and so on and so on. So again, this knowledge is practical and also in the term needed to understand more complex um, things. So that's why I like also understanding that and teaching that. So I hope that you will have learned something from, from this. I believe we can summarize now uh, the whole webinar today. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so uh, the, the, um, the, the whole webinar was about uh, threading. Uh, we are .netos, and if this webinar uh, made you interested in, in learning not only the the newest and the shiniest framework uh, on, uh, on on Nougat or uh, wherever. If you want to learn um, about things like this and learn strong foundations behind the uh, asynchronicity, asynchronous programming, concurrent, parallelism, all the primitives mentioned in here. If you want to hear me talking one hour about volatile again that was just a silly joke sorry only one but, hour <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it too. Uh, but if you want to learn more or um please take just take a look at the agenda of uh, async expert course uh we are currently in the uh last week uh of of sale and we are closing it on uh friday 8 p.m central european time uh, so we try to do our best to, to list all the all the things that we will cover in the course and we are covering because the, the first week is already there, but you still can um, enroll and, and uh, be the part of, um, of this of this course. If that made you interested uh, somehow, we are strongly encouraged you to visit the, the site. It's just asyncexpert.com or PL if you know the magic and you do speak Polish language uh, as, uh, as we do. Uh, visit it, take a look at the agenda. And if you have any doubts or questions, you can just, um, you can just ask us uh, either via site or our email, uh, etc. I, I think, Conrad, that I... But I answered all the questions where when you you were talking. So I, I pasted okay. the images and um, all the different things. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have any more questions, we will be just uh, on Twitter, for example. So you can reach us all the time. So just do not hesitate uh, to ask us even after 
the webinar ends, which will happen in a few seconds, I believe. So, yeah, okay, yeah, it, it was a great pleasure. Uh, uh, again, sorry for the initial context switch, but come on, we needed to make this that joke about <laughs> uh, about it. Uh, uh, we hope that you enjoyed it, that you learned a lot, uh, and that we'll meet in the async expert. Right, exactly. Thank you very much for having uh, time with us and uh, we'll see you soon somewhere. Yep. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.